also really happy to see some new people that I don't know, people who represent what will be the next generation of IPS, the next 50 years of IPS. And I welcome you all in the spirit of future collaborations. Um, there are many future collaborations in here, and also just thinking that some of you might get inspired by something you hear tonight or this weekend, and it'll change the way you think or act. We've put this panel and this weekend together as a reflection of what IPS sees as important. We strongly believe there is a new generation of progressive leadership emerging in this country and around the world that can transform this world. May and Ijen and Jamie are part of that, as are many of the others you will meet this weekend. And then there are leaders who are in their prime, like Barbara and Bob. Now, did I do that okay? Barbara and Bob, they're in their, in their prime. <laughs> and one key to wise choices, we believe, on the work and campaigns that we can do is to bring together intergenerational dialogue. And that's what this panel and this weekend is structured around. We actually represent most of the decades of the last um, 70 years uh, on, this, on this panel. We also believe that all kinds of movements are necessary to make change. And some social movements, some activists, some think tanks, some elected officials, some media, some spontaneous action like Occupy Wall Street and a lot of glue. And you'll see over the weekend, IPS has identified 50 core allied groups that we work closely with and we'll be introducing you to them as this weekend progresses. We'll be celebrating them at this big gala we're holding in Union Station on Sunday night that I hope you will all be at. And we'll be writing about them in blogs and articles and, and sharing their good work. At IPS, from the beginning till now, we feel that social change, the most important social change, comes from dynamic movements linked with good ideas and good analysis. And hence, we shape our work in conjunction with those movements. An act that we call, this was a Mark term, public scholarship. We spend a lot of time on the bigger long-term vision of the change we need, and we're very excited to have been in dialogue with a number of groups that are here um, one that we'll hear a little bit more about in the conversation is National People's Action, which has just put forward a, a brilliant 40-year vision of the future. And with that vision, that vision can guide smarter choices on campaigns and on policy and on work. For example, we see a Wall Street tax as a smart step to transform a speculative Wall Street economy into a green Main Street economy. And we're really happy to be working with a lot of you on that. We also braid together at IPS from the start the work on peace with the work on justice and equity with the work on environment. We see them as one. We do this work locally, nationally, and globally, understanding that even the smallest local problems are often interconnected with global events. And we're also out there getting out cutting edge research and analysis on things like poverty through Barbara's economic hardship and reporting project on foreign policy through our foreign policy and focus on inequality through inequality.org that Sam Pizzagatti runs here too much. And on everything else, we have one thing I want to invite you to. We have the best op-ed service in the country called Other Words, edited by Emily Schwartz Greco, which gets op-eds to the 1,700 smaller newspapers in every state, red states, purple states, and blue states. We're not just talking to our friends. So we, with this weekend, are offering our commitment to continue this inspiring work for the next 50 years. And so for us, these conversations this weekend are about building dialogues and new alliances to move this forward. And we need all of you, not just tonight, but in the long haul. So let's kick off this conversation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a couple of questions to each of the five, looking more for short answers, two to three minute answers, and then get some conversation going among them, and then we'll pull you, the audience, in. We've got a mic another microphone we can bring around. This movement is called the Future of Progressive Movements, and 
We know that in the three decades since Reagan's election in 1980, corporations and the 1% have gained some power. We know they've been able to win some victories, and we know we've been able to win some victories. But overall, the right is stronger than it was 30 years ago. And in this context, I really do want to provoke people on the panel um, to, to really reflect on what we've won, where we've lost, and why. And what do we need to do to win more and win better in the next decade, and how do we organize ourselves to do this? And we've got someone here who works at a state level. How can state level fights reinforce national and global fights and vice versa? Um, obviously, right now, we're in the midst of giant fights over immigration rights, over health care. How do we win? So I'm going to start with you, Ai Jin Poo, uh, director of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, a group that we are very proud to call a core ally. Um, Ai Jin... <laughs> Uh, and her group have won some big victories in the last month, two months. And I'm wondering if you could describe one, Aijin, and just say a little bit, because we hadn't been winning a lot in the previous decade, um, a little bit about what you did differently that you think helped make the difference and, and any lessons we can draw from that. Sure. First of all, I have to start by saying happy 50th anniversary, IPS. I am so excited for this weekend-long celebration. I think we should celebrate actually for 50 days. But a weekend is a good start, um, and I'm really honored to be part of the kickoff panel. Uh, so one victory that we're very proud of um, is a victory that is not only our own, obviously. All of these victories are a real movement-wide effort, but we were part of a coalition of groups who for years and years have been working to change the exclusions in the Fair Labor Standards Act, which offer minimum wage and overtime protections um, for American workers. There have been groups of workers who've been excluded for 75 years, um, and home care workers, caregivers, uh, are among them. And f since the Clinton administration, there's been an attempt to try to change Department of Labor regulations to bring 1.8 million home care workers under minimum wage and overtime protections. And so in an amazing partnership among uh, lots of unions and organizations, including a lot of you in this room, um, over many, many years, we worked in partnership with the administration. And as a result, gosh, just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, um, the regulations were finally released. And... <laughs> I, I believe it's one of the most significant advances for low-wage workers of the Obama administration. And what it means is we actually geeked out and did the math. Um, and what we realized is that if maybe 75% of those workers get three hours of overtime per week as a result of this change, it means over $1.7 billion back in the pockets of low-income and poor women workers in this country per year. Um, so it's a really significant victory. Um, yeah. So, I, I just to keep you on this for a minute more. Say, so I'm, we are part, IPS is part of a coalition that Ijen and Sarita Gupta of Jobs with Justice uh, co-chair called Caring Across Generations, which is part of this, and other groups were part of it too. But it's a different mode of coalition building. And I, I just wonder if you'd say a word about that and, and whether you think a different way of organizing is, is the key or, or some other factor. Well, uh, the effort that we're in together is called Caring Across Generations, and there's about 200 organizations, um, women's groups, senior disability groups, uh, AFSCME, SEIU, home care unions, immigrant rights organizations, all kinds of organizations who are part of it. And the context is, you know, the, the incredible change that we're experiencing in this country, both in terms of demographics and economically, and I think 
It, it really is a paradigm shift moment in this country. The kinds of profound demographic shifts that we're experiencing where both racially, right, we're about to be a majority minority nation, and then generationally, we're about to have the largest older adult population in the history of the country with 10,000 people turning 65 per day and people living longer than ever. And so we believe that that moment, this moment of profound paradigmatic change in this country offers an opening, an opportunity to actually shape the future in our values. Um, and it could go the other way. We could face increasing uh, and deep polarization along lines of race and generation and class. Or we could see this moment as an opportunity to put forward a vision for the future of the country that really does connect all of us and really does support all of us to achieve and reach our full potential. But that means all of us. It has to be fully inclusive. So what Caring Across Generations is trying to do is trying to articulate a vision for the future of long-term care in this country that both offers transformed support for families and people in need of support, services, and care, um, and transforms every one of those jobs into, good jo uh, into a job that you can take pride in and support your family on, a living wage job with benefits. And that's the vision. It's an intergenerational vision that explicitly talks about generational and racial shifts that are happening in this country and talks about the ways in which we're interconnected and interdependent. So there's a policy piece to it, and there's also a values, a very emotional, personal piece to it. And I think that um, campaigns that allow us to really contend in the arena of hearts and minds and bring diverse constituencies together it may be in a different context, we would call them unlikely allies. But we believe in this moment, um, when the future of the country is at stake, there's no such thing as an unlikely ally. And our job is to articulate the vision that makes that real. Thanks. Hi, Jen. Yeah, it's the first thing I've been involved in that uses race and class and love in the same sentence. <laughs> Very powerful. So I can turn next to May Boomby, who many of you know, the youngest member of our panel. So we go from the 20s to the 30s, I mean the 30s to the 20s here, um, not the 1930s. <laughs> You're old, 20 year old. May is the director, executive director of 350.org, uh, which has exploded on the scene in the last five years. Uh, and not just here, but also globally. And so, um, and again, we've been, we're thrilled to be involved in campaigns with them, one right now around divesting from fossil fuels and reinvesting in all the good things that, that I know you we're all for. And I, I, it's, I think, a different model um, than what Ijen just described. And it'd be great if you could say a little bit about the model and how you think it's, it's working. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and I have to say special thanks to John because I know iGen because of John, which is something I'm, I'm very grateful for and happy to get to know the rest of you tonight. Um, so in terms of the model of the way we work, at 350.org, I'm one of the co-founders and we started in around 2008. Um, and we often say that the kind of work we're doing around the world only really makes sense in the internet age. Uh, the ability for some of the connectedness that happens around the world around the issue of climate change uh, is really facilitated by the rapid connections that the internet makes possible. On the other hand, as we've been doing more and more work and increasingly confronting the root causes of climate change, which are many of the root causes of all the other issues we're going to talk about, internet organizing is only so valuable. And as time goes on, we've learned more and more about the relationship between the online, the offline, mobilization, traditional grassroots organizing. So we're really interested at sitting at the nexus of the, the old and the new and trying to see what, um, what we can learn from historic social movements and what we can learn from movements today. Um, and what that leads me to think about is we're in an era of incredibly vibrant and dynamic social movements. And I think it's one of the most hopeful things that we can look to. 
And I'm happy to report that the climate movement is no exception. <laughs> and uh, I think that's largely for two reasons. Um, first and foremost, the urgency of the issue has become so much more apparent to so many more people. And uh, John, you were saying, you were reflecting on the previous three decades since the Reagan era. Not only uh, have we seen some of the changes you described, but the last three decades were also the three hottest decades on record. No coincidence, perhaps. <laughs> um, but, you know, as all joking aside, when we started doing our work, uh, I think there was a strong question that how will people begin to see the immediacy of climate change? It feels so far away. People are talking about it in terms of policy prescriptions for the year 2050. And fast forward to 2013, that is not the world we're living in anymore. And it is no more uh, an issue for far away, a far away time and far away people. It's a very present reality for almost everyone I can think of. So I think that's one component to why the movement has become so dynamic. The second is the analysis of the problem has changed. And I think the traditional environmental movement's emphasis on changing the light bulb, biking a bit more, composting sometimes, no longer makes sense in this, the scale of this issue. And the movement has risen to that, that challenge. And that's why campaigns to confront the fossil fuel industry, uh, confront infrastructure projects like the Keystone XL pipeline and coal exports and numerous other things. Um, this, is a, this is the new direction of the movement. This is why the movement's taken on more challenges and I think why we're more successful. So that's a bit, okay, great. bit on no, the topic. And, and, and I just I want to say, because part of the, the conversations that May and Ijen and I have had and others of you is two of the most dynamic social movements of the past 50 years, so of the period of, of IPS, are the labor movement and the environmental movement. Huge movements, millions of people, huge victories, um, but often at odds with one another, often clashing. And I'm curious if you could say a little bit about how you are approaching what has been a divide that has weakened us. Thanks, John. <laughs> Yeah, right. Um, well, honestly, a lot of the people sitting here have, have been teachers about this. Um, and I was just on the train here reading a new report about um, alternative jobs pathways along the proposed route of the Keystone XL pipeline um, through, from our friends at the Labor Network for Sustainability. And I think they're doing a panel tomorrow. Yeah? Shout out for that panel. Um, honestly, I think we have a long way to go. Um, from the climate movement side, and I, I'll be completely honest about that. But some of the things that are um, bright spots on the horizon are, you mentioned it, John, this idea of reinvestment. As we move our investments out of the gigantic fossil fuel sector, where do we put it? Can we put it in the new economy? And this question is starting to drive a lot of really interesting collaborations be between mayors and city council members and investors and unions about, we, we're not broke, we're just investing in the wrong things. So what, what can we begin to imagine if that shift becomes possible? And so I think that's a real, a real bright spot. And so too is, I think, working in the streets together and mobilizing together, and that's starting to happen more as well. So I think a lot of organizations have been doing great work in this area. So that's, that's what I'd point to. Okay, thanks. All right, we'll sw switch next to uh, State Senator Jamie Raskin. And we've gone a little bit here from the national to the global and now to the state level. So Jamie is a state senator in one of the 10 or 11 states where Democrats control everything, uh, the, the governorship and and the legislature, both houses in, in this case. And you've won a lot of things. I mean, in the last year or two, a number of them, <laughs> a number of them introduced by, by Jamie. Um, and I'm curious if you could say, I mean, maybe pick the one that most surprised you or that you were happiest about and tell us why you won. And I'm curious, I think, Many of us who've been so focused on the national level and now see such gridlock have been thinking that a smart path forward is to really try to win things. Ijen 
and, and her allies just won a, a domestic worker bill of rights in California, signed by Jerry Brown and Hawaii. So <laughs> what you think about what you're doing in relation to these, these national struggles? Thank you, John. Um, I'm delighted to be with everybody tonight. And if you'll forgive me for one second, John, I just, uh, I was reflecting uh, that when I was a kid, uh, growing up kind of in the IPS family, the right wing tried to shut IPS down uh, when Richard Nixon was president, with the enemies list, with the IRS, the IRS and the FBI, the espionage, the surveillance, the, the undermining. Uh, and then, of course, the the right wing from Chile came and killed uh, Orlando Latelier and Ronnie Carp and Moffett. Um, but I was thinking, here we are on Friday night in Washington. They never succeeded in shutting down IPS, but they did shut down the U.S. government. Um, and, uh, which leads me to believe you can shut down the U.S. government, but you can't shut down IPS. Uh, so... Uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so I, you know, John, John's my, John is too modest. Uh, he's not only the, the brilliant organizer and catalyst of IPS today, he's also my constituent, okay? So, uh, which is how I got invited here tonight. Uh, but, um, but, but John, but, well, let me start by saying this. When I ran for office, it was in the, the depths of our despair. In 2006, uh, George Bush was in his second term of office. We had uh, two wars going in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, paid for by three tax cuts on the rich. Um, the Supreme Court had put George Bush in office, um, and um, uh, I, I was and I continue to be a law professor, but I realized that uh, if I was going to live up to any of my family's values and beliefs, I had to stop writing law review articles and do something. Uh, and my state senator had uh, introduced a death penalty bill, which just kind of pushed me over the edge. And you got to understand, uh, today everybody says District 20, which is Silver Spring and Tacoma Park, is the most progressive area. And, of course, you can do all these things because you're from District 20. Thank you. A shout out to all of my uh, constituents here. But... Back in those days, it was just like everywhere else. Um, and, uh, but I said I was going to run. And I was running against a 32-year incumbent who was president pro tem of the Senate and the chair of the Montgomery County delegation, but had introduced this death penalty bill, had introduced electricity deregulation, which made everybody's electric bills go up 70%, um, had done nothing for... Um, uh, gay rights or marriage equality, despite the fact that we have a very substantial gay lesbian population. And so, uh, so I announced. And when I first announced, uh, one of the pundits told the Washington Post that my chances of winning were impossible. <laughs> and then nine months later, I got 67% of the vote. And, 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 one, and one, of the, one of the Washington Post pundits... One of the pundits told the Post that my victory was inevitable. So I went from impossible to inevitable in nine months. Um, and it was totally through grassroots organizing that the change was made. And it was organizing um, environmentalists and the gay lesbian movement and so on. The current debate is going around poverty and, and, and how you think we ought to rethink. <clears throat> well, uh, first, uh, I want to remind Jamie that I was there at a rally for you at the very beginning. <laughs> Remember, I'm out of the street. All right, okay. you, you, you were there before my dad was there. <laughs> I talked him into it. You know? <laughs> I mean, it, it's odd for me to be in this situation, like come up with some, you know, wise and brilliant thoughts, because I need to understand something. This is where I go, I guess, when I need to figure out what to do. Or it's friends. If I, if I need to know where to show up on the street, Medea Benjamin. Uh, you know, if I need, well, who else do we have? You know, they, again and again, I've had a question, an issue, uh, just uh, something tormenting me. How do we think about this? What do we do about this? I go to IPS, and they tell me what to do. I thought about this today, John, because 
This today, you might not have noticed, there was a uh, an attempted action by truckers to shut down DC. They hadn't been told that it was done for them and there was no reason to come here, but they, uh, they organized and they planned to shut down the city uh, to force the impeachment of President Obama. Um, which would, no, no more legislative branch, why not, you know. And what I remember, I think it was 2007 or eight, when I had, I got in contact, somehow, um, as a journalist, got in contact with a bunch of truckers uh, who were uh, angry about uh, the um, high price of deal, uh, diesel fuel, and couldn't support their families. And they said they would get 100 trucks uh, to DC. Uh, and what should they do? And so I went to IPS and said, there are 100 angry truckers coming. What are we going to do? How are we going to help them? And you know, that's the great thing about IPS. They just said, we're on it. Uh, IPS did it, the publicity, walked them through, and probably showed them we're out of lobby in the Capitol. Uh, we talked, well, some of us talked endlessly about environmental issues and so forth with these uh, with these guys who are not always into that that much. And it was very successful. They got, you know, tremendous news. And, and that's what we did. That was uh, it's another, another side of IPS. You know, they can move fast like that. Um, I um, um, just want to say one thing. I'm not going to talk in detail about my project or that I'm involved with and Karen Dolan and other people here, I think, uh, Economic Hardship Reporting Project, except, except to say there is one lesson that arises from it that I think um, somewhat relates to this discussion of the future of progressivism. And my concern is with the, with the right wing shutting down the government and all the other things it's done is that we as on the left or the liberals get in a position of well, we are the defenders of government. Uh-uh. That cannot be our position. We can't be forced by the Tea Party to say, yeah, oh yeah, oh, we're, we're for government. They're against, we're for. And that's really how a lot of pundits see the difference. And it reminds you, uh, the government isn't all Jamie Raskins, um, <laughs> that, um, you know, the government includes uh, some of the institutions that IPS has been chronically critical of, uh, the military, um, the prison system, uh, immigrant detention centers, the war on drugs, San Jose Free is here, who uh, is our um, point man on that, and the National um, Security Administration, which is no doubt amongst us right now. <laughs> and, you know, that I, I think that's one of the things that gets in our way sometimes as part of our image, as being people on the left liberal end of things if, when we're dealing with truck drivers or what, whoever. Well, aren't you the guys who are for big government? No. No, we are the critics of unjust and oppressive government as well as of uh, corporate power. Bob Greenstein in, and, and uh, partly we want to have a kind of con a conversation about some of these issues. But many of you know Bob runs really the most influential think tank that deals with poverty and budget priority issues, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And he was a student at IPS in the 60s. I'm going to say a minute, something about that in a, in a minute. I did want to say to Bob that you inspired our um, 50th anniversary naked uh, t-shirts this year because on one of Bob's anniversaries a few years ago, he did a great mug. Uh, the mug said Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, and on the back it said, only the name is boring. So our, our slogan, we did a you know, naked IPS t-shirt, it's got some of our reports on the cover and some of them, and on the back it says, and you thought our reports were boring? <laughs> Now, last week in a conversation, Bob, you said to me, to be effective, we need to be effective on both offense and defense. 
And I want to ask you what you meant by that. Could, could I just say before I answer it, I'm so pleased uh, to be here. I was connected to IPS way back in 1968. And uh, in fact, I'm, I, my, my only regret tonight is the person who connected me who was at IPS for years, Sue Thrasher, couldn't be here now because she was in a bicycle accident. Um, but when I discovered IPS in the late 60s, it was really a revelation. I didn't know institutions like this existed. And I started the Center on Budget in late 81. John, I don't think it would have occurred to me, I would have conceived that one could put together an organization that would blend policy analysis and advocacy if I hadn't been carrying around in my head for 13 years what, what I had seen in IPS in the late 60s. When, when IPS started to do this, I don't think anybody else did it at that point. Uh, there are other organizations that do or try to do these things today, but IPS was really in many ways the pioneer of blending really deep, thoughtful policy analysis, new ways of looking at things, developing new policies, with the idea that this wasn't for an academic purpose, it was to change the world. Um, so, you know, to me there's just a, a, an enormous debt there. Offense and defense, well, we all see things going on all the time. We can just look at what's going on now, the government shutdown and other things. Uh, the Bush tax cuts, the Iraq war, where does one start or where does one end? Uh, of things that need to be closed. But in, in the area I work the most in and have for several decades, you know, in terms of trying to get policies that can significantly reduce poverty and inequality. When you make a major gain, you know at some point the pushback is coming. I mean, I, I still remember this bill we passed in the late 70s that dramatically expanded the food stamp program. We got the first reports of, you know, like 300% increases in rural Mississippi in, in participation. And I, I took them to my mentor, the late John Kramer. I was showing him the data. I was at the agriculture department at the time. And he took one look at the data and he said, Robert, this is what we wanted, and now we gird our loins because the attack is coming. So I think when you make progress, you know, it's two or three steps forward, and then the attack comes and you try and avoid losing any ground at all. If you have to lose ground, you maybe go one step backward while you're, you limit it to one step backward while you're developing your strategies to do two or three steps forward as soon as the opportunity arises. So I think there's a, there's a synergy between offense and defense, but the, the Affordable Care Act perhaps is the, the best example uh, for all its imperfections. Uh, it is the most significant piece of legislation in several decades in uh, addressing the needs of lower income people and reducing inequality. It's, you know, health care, for low-income and moderate-income people, and a lot of the financing or revenue increases on people at the top of the income scale. It is not a, it is nothing mysterious about the fact that there is a ferocious assault on the Affordable Care Act, and the defense of it is, is critically important. And when the opportunity arises, and the political pendulum turns, it will be time to try to improve the Affordable Care Act and make it significantly better than it is. At the moment, the task is vehement defense. Uh, for those who would want to completely turn that clock backwards. So I, I think one needs to think of a lot of these issues as a mix of offense and defense. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so before we come out to all of you in the audience and think of things that you might want to ask these great people, I just would love to, to push the panel a little bit more. First, I mean, to see if there's anything you want to respond to that anyone else has said, but also, to throw out there in terms of big, bold visions. IBS says that we want to eliminate extreme inequality in the next decade. And we say it, we say it, I mean, part of the way we put it in the, in the midst of the fights of, and, and the uprising of Occupy Wall Street was um, 
as important as the civil rights movement was to taking on racism in this country and the women's movement and taking on sexism and the gay rights movement and taking on homophobia, the, the biggest obscenity in America today is the grotesque inequality. And, and we must come together around ending extreme inequality. And at the same time, we say, equally as, as May has pointed out, equally compelling is we must drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, to save the planet. And I'm curious whether any of you think we can win significantly on either of these over the next decade, but more importantly on whether we can win significantly on both together. So I want to put that on the table, but I also want to give you a chance to respond to anything you've heard so far. So we'll go back to you, Aijin. Let's take maybe a minute or two just for each of you, and then, and then we'll open it up. Um, uh, less than a year ago, probably about nine months ago, I heard uh, the great Frances Fox Piven speak. Um, and given that she spent her life studying poor people's movements and social movements, I thought, um, you know, definitely worth checking out what she has to say about this moment. And what she said was that she believes that from everything that she's observing, that what we're seeing is the beginnings of the next great social protest movement in this country that will fundamentally redefine democracy. Um, and it will be a movement around inequality. And, um, and so I tend to go with what she has to say <laughs> um, in general. But on this one, uh, I definitely think that that you could see that, you know, and I can feel it when I am around domestic workers who are organizing in 28 cities around the country or when I watch the fast food worker organizing and the Walmart workers starting to come together and all the restaurant workers, all the exciting energy that's happening among low wage workers. But I actually think that when you take a step back and look at the scale of all of that, it's still not inevitable that we are at the cusp of the next great social movement that will redefine democracy. And so I'm really interested in this impossible to inevitable theme that has come up on this panel. And, and to me, um, I think it's our job uh, to do the organizing and do the ideas and vision and strategy work, all of that, the action, the ideas to action work that actually makes it inevitable um, and it's possible. I totally agree and was just going to add on to something that you were saying about why is it that the backlash sometimes comes as a bit of a surprise and I was thinking about in our case Often the campaigns we find to be the most successful, we do not expect to be successful at all. And so when the backlash comes, we're scrambling, not only to consolidate the gains on offense, but also defense. And I think iGen's right. I think unless we're putting forward our irresistible vision, um, it's going to continue to feel impossible. So I guess our ch maybe the challenge for this weekend is to see how few times we can use the word impossible um, and, and the, li the limiting of our own ideas because I think most of the public is, is with us and I think no matter what issue you're tracking, the polling seems to be backing that up. Um, and I wanted to also respond with a, something that Naomi Klein um, said recently that I, it's just been dancing around in my head and I think it's the, the best um, short summary I've seen that connects climate to the broader set of economic justice issues we face. And here, here's what she said, and this was uh, delivering a speech to Unifor, which is a major Canadian union, and this was a, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, my argument is that the climate threat makes the need to fight austerity all the more pressing, since we need public services and public infrastructure to both bring down our emissions and prepare for the coming storms. In fact, climate change turbocharges our existing demands and gives them a basis in hard science. It calls on us to be bold, to get ambitious, to win this time, because we really cannot afford any more losses. 
So that's been something that's really animating us lately and certainly this fossil fuel divestment campaign. Um, and this idea that by challenging the industry, we're not only building a stronger movement, but um, that actually the stigmatization process around the industry is one of the strongest political and economic levers we have. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Two points. Well, one is suggested by um, Bob's statement, looking at the past. Um, I, I believe that IPS was the first think tank that was geared to social movements and political change. I think before that, you had the Rand Corporation and think tanks that had nothing to do with social movements in the country and social movements that didn't have the backing of an intellectual apparatus and an idea factory like IPS. So, um, so anyway, I you know respect to IPS for what you guys have done. Um, looking forward, um, you know, I'm impressed by the absolute unpredictability and uncertainty of things. I mean, no, nobody uh, foresaw the collapse of the Soviet Union and bureaucratic state socialism uh, and the coming down of the Berlin Wall and nobody, none of the economists were predicting the Wall Street crash Except and for Dean Baker. Except for Dean Baker. I need to speak that one. <laughs> none, none of the establishment economists did. You know, and, and uh, none of the political observers, except, I don't know, maybe Steve Cobble predicted Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> uh, so, um, so I guess I would say, um, you know, I, I believe we are living in a period of post-ideology, at least I don't believe in any iron will of history moving in any particular direction. I just believe in the power of people to get together and change things. Um, and so for me, this is a, a period for populist organizing and insurrection against unjust policies and unjust institutions. <laughs> Uh, well, I, um, uh, one way I bring together the issues of climate change and inequality is by keeping up with the work of Sam Pizzicotti. Stand up! <laughs> one of the invaluable he, things he does is uh, track the uh, profligate and disgusting lifestyles of the super rich. <laughs> and you want to know what, you know, that's what's wrong with the planet. I mean, it's the, it's the problem with inequality is it just, well, some people have more and that's not fair. It's that those people at the top are wrecking things. You know, whether, whether it's their private jets or, well, I, Sam, Sam will tell you afterwards, or, or, or tomorrow, we'll tell you all about that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that important work also. And Chuck Collins, I guess. That's who should be talking here about these things. I just have one thing to add to what uh, Jamie and me and, um, and um, uh, I, Jen, have said, and that I guess it go goes along with your unpredictability theme, Jamie, is we have seen in the last two years not only the rise of and fall or you know, doing something else of, of Occupy, but we have seen revolutionary movements around the world that seem to come out of nowhere. I don't think anybody in May in Brazil could have told you that there would see, soon be hundreds of thousands of people on the street because of bus fares, ostensibly, and everything else. Egypt, no, there was no, no predicting that. We had the largest human political demonstrations on earth in Egypt that brought down um, the Morsi government. And this has gone from, let me see, uh, Turkey, well, what am I leaving out now? Um, you know, this is, this is a, we are, Occupy was tiny compared to these things. We are now part of a global change. And we don't understand its dynamics. 
you don't understand, you know, it's part because it's electronically mediated in many ways, but it's multi-issue, ground up, and it's drawing from, among other things, on all the low-paid workers of the world, but also the growing global class of people who are educated and can uh, find work or work that suits their, uh, you know, what they've been trained to do. So things are moving. Things are moving in ways, you know, that are overwhelming and fast. And we're just gonna stay up front a little bit. Great, thanks. I think I'm gonna live up to my reputation of being a little less sanguine. I really, I really am an optimist or I wouldn't have been able to do all the work I've been doing in recent decades. But those of people who know uh, our, our work and how I think about things now, I, I always think that to develop the most effective strategies, you have to start out by being pretty brutal in, in acknowledging or recognizing the challenges we face. So let's take inequality. Most of the battles we've been fighting in recent years are to moderate the degree by which inequality gets worse. You know, uh, here we are, we, compared to what some people predicted, I guess it was a victory that the estate tax was not totally gotten rid of, but you know, whatever, 90% of it, the bulk of it is gone. Um, the major attempt to do something somewhat larger and adequate as it was would have been a big step forward on climate change in 2009 that cap and trade bill just crashed and died there's nothing big being talked about now in terms of you know the, the political system what lies behind this so i think there are a couple of fundamental issues uh, where it's not totally clear what the answers are. Um, you know, I think if one looks, knits together the Bush v. Gore decision, the Citizens United decision, the voting rights decision, what they all have in common, all those court decisions, is they're about changing the landscape of political power, the, the ability to win elections, and so forth making it harder to amass the electoral victories one would need to get more substantial change in areas like inequality and climate. And connected to that, obviously, to turn that around, one has to win a lot of elections for a while, including over time changing the Supreme Court, by virtue of winning a lot of elections for a while and having different people you know, particularly in the Senate, who gets confirmed and so forth. So I think that leads to another issue which is pretty fundamental. The movements we're all talking about are critical, they're exciting, they're important. But we are in deep trouble with white lower middle class downscale voters. I mean, People are angry and get resentment when the economy performs as badly as it has in recent years. And too many of those people who've been hurt by the economy have been attracted by the Tea Party and, and right-wing sentiment. It is astonishing to me when you look at the polling data on attitudes among, you know, not, not just affluent voters, but more downscale white voters, people who ought to be part of the broader progressive alliance. I, I, other people in this room and on this panel have better senses than I do. It's not my, my area of deep experience and expertise, how you turn that around. But I think the gains we can win are going to be limited until we have on a large scale a change in, in perceptions, political alliances, a variety of things on, on that part of the electorate. We will be heavily helped, to be sure, by the demographic changes in the country, the growing percentage of voters who are Hispanic or African American. Uh, but, you know, if the margins, if the combination of margins remaining where they are among a lot of the white voters, 
and actions by institutions like the court in terms of campaign financing and being able to vote in the first place is, is a strategy to really frustrate on every front, climate, inequality, you name it, workers' rights, the progressive agenda. So I, I, I think we have a big challenge in overcoming that in, in order to pursue all the other things that bring all the people who are here tonight into this room. Okay, th yeah, thank you, Bob. And I, that's provocative. And I think that, and I, we want to pull people in here. I, just one thing I want to say, I remember when the Tea Party first started, the first big rallies, Barbara Ehrenreich said to us, go out there and talk to those people. And, and, and I remember Barbara going down, a good reporter in her, and instead of yelling at the Tea Party, she interviewed them and, and, and came up with a lot of similar conclusions to what you just said, Bob. Okay, I'm looking out here at like some amazing people. Um, Anthony Bucci, who helped us with our latest CEO pay report from George Washington, has got the microphone. Um, so let's take five or six people, if you could keep it to one to two minutes. Um, Mark Elrich there in the back. I mean, we'll go, if you want to go all the way back to the back left corner. Uh, who Mark was one of 300 local elected officials who joined us in a Mark Raskin idea called Cities for Peace that Karen helped carry out. They've got cities to stand up uh, and pass resolutions to get to the wrong door. So, so I want to talk about something that people can actually do when you talk about income inequality. In, um, I made an announcement in the first week of September that I was going to introduce the minimum wage bill. Love her. I made an announcement in the first week of September I was going to introduce the minimum wage bill in Montgomery County. I was going to introduce a bill that I proposed for $12 an hour. And there was a little glitch in when I could get it introduced, and so I had some meetings and I met with the chamber. And it was really interesting. Two things came out of it. Um, one was, they said, you're making us stand out again and look bad because Montgomery County has this horrible reputation for being anti-business. And then they said, why are you doing it? And I realized, I just said to them, I said, you come to my offices all the time, you tell me the government costs too much, I spend too much on social services, and your taxes are too high. I said, well, everything I pay for, most of the government outside of police and fire, is social services for people you won't pay decent wages to. So if you want the welfare state to go away, pay them decently so I don't have to provide welfare. <laughs> their advice. I went to Phil Mendelson on the DC Council, I went to Andrea Harrison on the Prince George County Council, and I said, ask Andrew, would you be willing to introduce a minimum wage bill? She thought about it, said, sounds like a good idea. DC had just had a fight with the Walmart bill. I went to Phil, I said, your, your mayor says he's interested in everybody, not just Walmart. Would you be interested? The two, the three of us spent two weeks coming to agreement on 11.50 an hour, I came down 50 cents, 11.50 for everybody else thought they could go. Three year phasing. Andrea got it introduced with every single council member in Prince George's County. I've got two co sponsors, I'm up to three votes, I need two more. I've been told by the county executive he won't veto it. He's going to support it. And I think Phil's going to be able to move the DC bill up. But I would bet that most of you live in either Montgomery County, Prince George's County, or the district. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about something you can do that will close the equality gap, and this is 2.5 million, million people living in our three jurisdictions, show up at the public hearings, write letters to the council members, write letters to the county executives and the mayor of D.C., and say this is what you want to do. I guarantee you, you could fill most of the auditorium in Montgomery County if you wanted to do that. If people like you showed up and you bought friends, you would send a very clear message. And this region would have an 11.50 minimum wage, highest in the country. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, let's, take, let's take three or four more. There's a young woman over here. Oh, right. Go ahead. Actually, hold up your hands if you want to say something. I know. Uh, I just wanted to just reel a quick story for Bob Reesden. To get, but I ran into Bob at a, at a party a couple months ago, and he told me the most 
amazing story about being at IPS in the 60s. And since this is the reunion, I thought it was just the perfect place to hear this story. When he was here in the 60s and working for three of our uh, core members, founders of IPS, and it was just an amazing story. And Bob, I wondered if you would share it with us. Okay, hang on, Bob. I know I should want to say something to Mark. Uh, we'll take a couple more. There's a woman over here who had a hand up. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Melissa. My question is, looking forward, is there anything about how we can start really using story as a way to look at economic inequality? Because look at how much progress has been made in using today's National Coming Out Day. So the use of story is changing the role how the role of the LGBT community in America over the last 40 years. And is there a way to take that tactic? to really look at economic inequality. I'm also wondering, I mean, I'm, just, I'm looking at Peter Edelman here, who's been one of yeah. our great allies, uh, and who, and who boldly in a report we did together with him laid out a two-page agenda to abolish poverty. I mean, I'm sitting there, standing here thinking you probably think this is a lot pretty meek and mild, this minimum wage stuff. I wonder if you just want to add any, any thoughts. Uh, Peter. Peter, by the way, we worked with Peter at IPS around who was then our favorite senator, I'm sure many of yours, Senator Paul Wellstone, who did more to raise the issues of poverty and poverty. It's great, it's great to have you here. Number one, we miss Paul Wellstone. Yeah. Number two, Liza. Uh, no. <laughs> Number one, we miss Paul Wellstone. Number two, Barbara Enright speaks for me. <laughs> Number three, what we heard about what's going on uh, between Montgomery County, Prince George's County, and the District of Columbia about the minimum wage is what we need to be doing. We need to be uh, opening up our government. We need to be doing a lot of things. but. It, we need to take this conversation always, uh, as everybody up there uh, does. I mean, the, we, we heard the specifics about what Ai Jen Fu has been doing and what the government has done in response in terms uh, of uh, people who are taking care of others at home. Uh, all of that has to come down to specific strategies and tactics that we do every day. That's how we get from here to there. We need the vision. And we need the work of everybody who we've heard from and many, many others around this country. So that's what I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Before we come back to you, let's get responses. I know I just wanted to say something. I know Bob has a story, uh, and others of you may want to react. And then we'll have time for one more, one more exchange. I, I just quickly wanted to lift up another, in addition to minimum wage, another major piece of fundamentally important, significant public policy that's hanging in the balance in this moment is immigration reform. Yes. And we've got to move it forward. 11 million people living in the shadows, living in fear of being separated from their families, unable to come into the full light of this economy and this democracy. And if they are, it has the potential to fundamentally transform all of our movements and what we're able to do politically. So we all, I think, have an incredible stake in winning immigration reform. So we have to move it. Um, it's going to take a really significant push to move it through the House. So hopefully we can think this weekend together about how we get that done. And I want to recognize Gordon Whitman from the PICO National Network, who's here. Uh, PICO's been doing great work organizing around immigration reform, as I'm sure a lot of you in this room are. Thank you. Bob, please. Yeah, I can't, it's hard to see everybody who's here. Actually, Gordon, I didn't know you were here, but I want to add my kudos to people. And a lot of people who love working with you. I don't know, Karen, you really want me to tell the story? <laughs> so, like lots of people of my generation, the Vietnam War period was really a the Vietnam War period was, was really a searing period that had a big effect on your political consciousness. 
And when I was trying to learn a little about it, I, I remember in the mid-60s reading a book that IBS was deeply involved in called The Vietnam Reader. And it was a collection of all sorts of art. And you learned a great deal, and you both learned and felt enraged and moved to try to figure out how you could act as you read the book. And then after that, I read this spectacular book, Intervention and Revolution by <coughs> Dick Barnett, that was, that was extraordinary. And so uh, it was 1968, and I was sort of not knowing what I was doing as a graduate student. I'm very interested in what I was doing in, in London. And Sue Thrasher said to me, you want to come back to the US you know, be a, a research assistant on this new project. And the new project was that, building on the Vietnam Reader book, there was going to be a book called The Cold War Reader. I thought this sounded great. So I came back, and the authors of The Cold War Reader were going to be uh, Dick Barnett, Gabriel Coco, Gar Alperwitz, and Mark Lassen. So I, I, I first went, and I met first with Gabriel Coco. And he said, uh, Cold War really has its roots in 1898. Start collecting documents from 1898. <laughs> then I met with Dick Barnett, and he said that the, the germs of the Cold War start in certain things between the U.S. and the Soviet Union in 43. Start collecting documents in 43. And then, my memory's a little fuzzy here, I think it was Mark, but it might have been Gar. I met with him, and they said, the key seminal events start in 1938. Start collecting <laughs> So I talked to the four of them, and I had four different views. And we're just kind of sure, well, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was some kid year out of college. And I kind of said, I've got these four different years. And they said, well, actually, we never sat down and talked to each other about our vision of the Cold War and what the reader should be and when it started. So, um, Basically, no one turned out to be all that interested in it, and it didn't actually happen. And, uh, the uh, book advance was given back to the book company. <laughs> Having said that, since that didn't happen, I then went off to, uh, for me, I went off to Boston and did some volunteer work around Mark's trial, the Spock Anti-Draft Conspiracy trial. And, uh, I didn't know what I was doing, and I don't think my volunteer work was of any value at all. But uh, I went to the courtroom every day, every day, and it had a big effect on my life because uh, I met my wife as a fellow spectator in the courtroom watching Mark's trial. <laughs> Floor now for other love stories of uh, <laughs> people you've met at an IPS event. Uh, they, they changed your life. I did, well, Julie Barton's court. There's someone here, let's take three or four more. Kathy Snyder over here, but start with the guy in the back and then Kathy, and we'll take two more and then a final round of, uh, of comments. Um, as climate disruption steadily worsens and climate change is many references to the idea of fighting carbon pollution with the ferocity the, the free world brought to fighting the world wars of the last century. So has there been any talk of using next year's 100th anniversary of World War I to declare a really robust home front war in the developed nations to fight climate change with stuff fossil fuel ration cards and turning off the lights as the new blackouts, and carbon offsets as war bonds, and many et cetera. So it seems like the Tea Party heyday may be over, and according to polls, it's like 17 to 25 Republican districts that now look and that if you really want to get work in those districts, we could possibly um, take back the House, and we could, in fact, have folks organized to do stuff in those districts, including put forth people we like. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So with the exception of, of Jamie and Mark, local exception, both from District 20, I don't think the left generally since the 70s has been interested that much in local politics. I think that, I think the right seized on school board, county council, general assembly. I think that's where the power comes from right now in the Tea Party. So I'm curious, Mark's already referred to this, uh, and I, I'd even say those of us outside of District 20, if asked who represents us on our school board, our, 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 our delegates, our county council people, probably most of us would come up blank. So my question to Jamie, outside of humor, which obviously you use, how do you manage to leverage progressive politics among conservatives and liberals and pass progressive <coughs> legislation? Woo, woo, Okay. All right, let's take those. Uh, wait, right down here. Yeah, you get the last question here, and then we'll uh, and we'll take two more. Yeah, you and the gentleman over here. Hi, my name. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Arlene Zarenka. I live in Missouri, which is a uh, very reactionary state. So I'm not in this Reno where you're being able to make, able to make great progress. So what I want to address is the question of the Supreme Court and the campaign finance, because I really do see that as critical. In Missouri, we have zero campaign finance laws. You can give unlimited amounts. We have a man named Rex Zingfield who moved to Missouri, very wealthy, who's been dumping literally millions in his favorite candidates' races. It doesn't mean they always win, but obviously they get a thrown leg up. I, I'm also an attorney, and I've really been puzzling over, I, I've not been able to come up with any constitutional amendment, so to speak, or the language that one could write to, uh, you know, I get solicitations from a public citizen, support a constitutional amendment. I would say yes, except that nobody's given me what sort of language would actually work, um, and also how we would ever get it through. The legislators are controlled by people who are being funded by business, you know, but because we have unlimited, or we were going towards unlimited campaign finance. I'm not very optimistic about the Supreme Court and what decision it's going to make on the most recent case that was just heard this week. So I just would thought maybe the panel could address something about how we deal with that coming onslaught, I think, more and more of unlimited funding and that that can then have a tremendous effect on who controls our legislators. And we have, by the way, a Republican majority that has a veto-proof majority in Missouri on both the House and the Senate. And that used to be a state that did not have a Republican majority on both sides. Okay, and just one more there, the gentleman. Uh, no, I, I, was, I was going behind, I mean, take two. I was going for the guy two rows back, but. <laughs> Sorry, we'll do both of you. We'll do your both, don't. Don't. Uh, yes, hand up, Bob. Do it both. Do both of you. We'll do both of you. Go ahead. Thank you, brother. Sorry, Bob. I'm uh, Clark Herbert, I'm just a local act activist. But one thing that I'm concerned about is something that's kind of skulking around secretly, uh, looking at our very dear freedoms and our very sovereignty. And this is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Woo! Which, uh, you know, could really endanger our um, freedoms on the internet, our access to generic drugs, of course, consumer, worker, and environmental freedom. So if, you could, if anybody could speak to that, that would be great. Thank you. <coughs> I want to welcome everybody in Washington. I'm right here. I'm Washington William H. Taft. I'm from the D.C. Council for Empowerment. Oh. I'm so proud to be here today when he challenged Reed up here on the hill and said, y'all, I'm not going to treat us like second-hand citizens anymore. And he's about to run out of money because he does not have, they didn't include him in the special box. So I was proud of my mayor standing up to that. I was very proud of that. So what I want to ask RPS to consider for us as D.C. is to look at the U.N. The U.N. has challenged the White House to deal with uh, uh, statehood and all the other treaties that were broken from the Indians and all, and they're supposed to have a report submitted back to the U.N. by September. This is September. So we'd like very much for you to follow up on that and have a two-day summit or something in D.C. for us. We would greatly appreciate that. Woo! Let's start maybe with Barbara and just work our way down. One to two minutes to each of you to address any that you heard. Barbara. Somebody else start. 
Oh, you don't want to go first? Okay, Bob, uh, you go first. Barbara doesn't want to go first. No, I'm happy to go first. I'm just going to... So Bob, wanna, hold the microphone just a little closer I want to your... focus on the question, I think, for you, about the Tea Party and the 2014 election. I certainly agree with you that every effort Stick should be... Stick into the mic! Uh, I certainly agree with you that every effort should be made on that front. Now, the odds of changing control of the House in the 2014 election are very small. And they're very small because of gerrymandering in the district. In 2012, Democrats got something like 1.5 million more House votes than Republicans yet Republicans have this substantial majority in the House that is being used every day to advance extreme policies and block reasonable policies. That happened in no small part following the 2010 elections in which there was a well-organized, well-financed right-wing sweep in governor's house, mansions, and state <coughs> legislatures across the country. So the moral of the story I draw here is that if we're planning not only for what we're doing next week and next month and next year, but farther into the future, progressives need a really intense ground game leading up to 2020. We have got to do really well in state-level elections in 2020. Supreme Court. I am very skeptical of being able to get a constitutional amendment to reverse these things. I, I spend from time to time a fair amount of my time fighting right-wing constitutional amendments like constitutional balanced budget amendments. And that's easier to do because an amendment needs two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of the Senate and three-quarters of the state is very hard. A better chance is over time to be able to win more elections, have both leg state legislatures, because that leads to redistricting the federal legislatures, White House, with, with a different configuration, and, all, and over time a different Supreme Court that can hopefully reverse a bunch of these decisions. But there's no substitute for being able to win elections. And because of the way our political system works, what we have seen in the last couple of years is you can win the votes and still lose the chamber because of things like redistricting and gerrymandering. So just, you know, as we think towards the future, 2020 is more important than your typical every two years. Uh, and the right took us to the cleaners and what they did in the 2010 election. It's not only having effects on who controls the House of Representatives. I mean, you look at states that are under unified conservative control now. North Carolina would be an example. And the kinds of policies that are enacting are way to the right of things we thought conceivable in our political system. They've moved the balance. Uh, so we, we really need to be planning for this throughout the whole decade and leading up to 2020. Thank you. Uh, I, just I really agree with that. And, um, and I think that in addition, I would add that I think we need a much more sophisticated and robust strategy that has to do with this point I made earlier about contending for hearts and minds that um, this point about storytelling and inequality that was raised earlier, I just think we need much more storytelling of telling the story about what's happening in the country to people um, on our terms. And influential storytellers in different arenas and everyday storytellers in different venues. I mean, I think it's, we cannot underestimate the importance of actually gaining some level of narrative power that we haven't been able to capture in the past. And so I think that's key to the defensive work we have to do to capture, to maintain the gains that we've made, but also key to us being able to be on offense more often. Yeah, just before, so before we go to May, I just want to say go to the Caring Across Generations website and you will see beautiful examples of this, of this storytelling. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm gonna just respond to a couple of the questions. Um, one on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, for people who don't know very much about that, I'm one of those people, but I know um, International Forum on Globalization has done a lot of early work researching that, so if you wanna learn more, they're a good source. And um, I'm glad it was brought up because it's a really good opportunity to do cross-national organizing, and uh, we spent more of our time tonight talking about work in the U.S., but I, one of the things that's most inspiring to me about IPS is the international solidarity work. Um, so some of our colleagues at 350 in Australia, uh, the Pacific, are really getting engaged around this plan. So stay tuned for some opportunities to work as a global community on that. Um, and I just want to second what Ijen said about storytelling and just go back to what I said at the beginning. You brought up that today's National Coming Out Day and the only reason I knew that is because on Facebook I was seeing all these stories from my friends about their stories of coming out and I thought, is this some sort of coordinated <laughs> storytelling day? And indeed it was. And I think that's a great example of how, how valuable Facebook and Twitter are in the dissemination of stories. So I think that sometimes for activism and organizing, it, there are limitations, but for storytelling, incredibly vital. So I think that's one of the best examples of how new technology can help us um, build this movement. And uh, the last thing I'll say is, I always like to end on a note about action. So um, I live in New York City, and uh, the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy is coming up on October 27th. It doesn't feels like sh even shorter than a year ago, um, but there's some organizing coming together between housing groups, economic justice groups, the New York chapter of Jobs with Justice, the Sierra Club, and 350, and hopefully many more to do a big march about marking that day and what it means for resilience in a city like New York um, and how we can build back better both to prevent to support public infrastructure to mitigate the problem, but also to adapt to what we can't prevent. So October 27th, uh, you can check out our website if you want to learn more, but for your friends in New York, please spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie should be last, because he'll be being more upbeat than I. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't met negative things. Me. <laughs> I, I wrote a book attacking positive yeah. things. <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, so I, 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 I've just been sitting here in this little warm bath of contentment and trying to think of something I possibly could disagree with because that's what gets me going a little bit. And, and I, I do want to say, yes, storytelling is nice, right? We like it. The media is not very interested, though. Very seldom can we get, you know, a human interest story uh, of somebody suffering uh, in the media. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, I have one thing about iGen. I did a story about iGen. Uh, that she was just uh, flattering me by saying got her more attention than I don't know, whatever prizes and being the one of the hundred most influential people on earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, um, but um, it wasn't in a regular um, me me media outlet, as far as I was concerned. It was in the Time, New York Times fashion supplement, <laughs> and I said. Uh, oh, this is embarrassing. I have a really gorgeous woman who is an organizer, <laughs> and I'd like to do a story about it. This is sad. I mean, I blush to say this. It worked. You, know, they took, you think they take a story that was about nannies and maids? No. But, they, you know, I'm just saying, there's a big thing. And don't forget, we've got so many exposés to do. Stories are good. But we also have to be talking about the rip-offs. I mean, we talk about needing to raise wages, of course. But we need to stop wage theft, where whatever people are paying, their miserable wages are stolen from them. We have to stop the criminalization of poverty and the way that poor people are harassed and, you know, uh, now fined for everything. We didn't fix the public schools, but we made 
truancy a crime in more and more place, parts of the country with huge fines and so on. Anyway, as far as the, um, the um, white uh, people who are not the affluent 1%, but the uh, others, we're talking here about my extended family. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I just have to say, this is why you know, I said my little thing about government. We are the libertarians. The Tea Party pretends to be. But they're only libertarians for the one percent. Nobody else. I want to take somebody at the you know, I want what I try to do is take people at kind of grassroots level who might be wavering or sympathetic and say, Where were you when we were fighting against stop and frisk? Where were you? You know, when we, we tried to prevent this from becoming, a, you know, a, an incarceration state. What are you doing? I think that we have to remember libertarianism is part of our makeup as progressives or as a left or anyway as radicals. Stick to it. Be strong. <laughs> Uh, but Barbara, I've got your book Against Positive Thinking, and I love it, and I hope you sign it for me, if you would. Um, so, so I, um, but I'll pick up the storytelling thing to answer um, the question that Mike Tabor had for me, which is how, how do you move the conservatives or get, bring people over? Um, and uh, so I'll tell you a few stories about my dad. Okay, because you know, IBS, uh, IBS is 50 and I'm 50. We were born the same year. Uh, and um, um, my dad's got uh, four human children and he's got IPS. Uh, and, uh, who he loves the most, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, so uh, I would say th three things. Let me tell you three lessons I got from my dad. One was when I was a kid, my dad would always say, that everybody has two impulses in life. And one is to stand like a tree and to be in one place. And the other is to fly like a bird. And my dad was always a tree person. And you can see the kind of fruit that that bears, being in one place. So I became a tree person. And so in my role as a state senator, I represent 150,000 people. I don't just represent John Cavana and Robin Broad and Mark Elrich and uh, the progressives. I represent, you know, I, I was at the Boy Scouts before I came here, and I represent, you know, the people in the PTAs, and I represent trade unions and small business people, and so if you stay in one place, you get to know a lot of different kinds of people, and so they will move you as much as you move them. So the question of how you move conservatives is you listen to them. See, maybe they've got something to teach us, too. So that's, yes. that's one thing. Um, a second thing that I learned from my dad, uh, somebody talked to, I, some, a couple of people mentioned the Boston Five trial, which was an indelible memory for me in my childhood. I was six years old when my dad and uh, Dr. Spot, William Sloan Coffin, and Michael Ferber, Mitchell Goodman were indicted for conspiracy to aid and abet draft resistance in the Vietnam War, and they were facing many, many years in prison. And I was six years old, and my, my younger brother was two, my older sister was 10 when it happened. Um, and they had a great legal team on their side, uh, Telford Taylor and William Kunstler, and they had great lawyers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the government, and uh, by the way, the Attorney General then was Ramsey Clark, for all you <laughs> Ramsey Clark fans. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, uh, the government had limitless resources, and they had to raise the money. So that taught me something there. But the way that they behaved taught me something about courage and standing up for what you believe in. Because if you go back and you read the testimony from the Boston Five trial, uh, my dad, in his testimony, basically put the government on trial and said it was an illegal, unconstitutional war that was in violation of international law. And um, he took the strongest stand, as far as I can tell, and he was the only one of the five who was acquitted at the trial level. Now, one of my students actually just wrote a paper about the Boston Five, and I, there's a quote 
that uh, was attributed to my dad, I guess it was New York Times the next day, where they, they asked how he felt about being the only one acquitted, and he said, well, I guess I could demand a retrial. <laughs> If you also go back and look at him, he was probably the only one who was guilty. Um, but so I think there's something that's standing for the things that you believe in that, uh, that is attractive across the board you know, to people when you get into politics. And then finally, um, uh, there, my dad has this wonderful quality, which those of you know him, will recognize, which is that he really does believe in the humanity and the possibility of everybody. And I always, uh, and, um, there, was a, there was a period when uh, I went to see my dad, it was in the, the old IPS, 1901 Q Street, and then across the street, they had the building across the street. And uh, so I went to meet him, we were going upstairs, uh, waiting for the elevator, we get in the elevator, and it's my dad and me and a guy who looks like a hell's angel who's just got out of prison on some hate crimes, okay? And he's got tattoos all over him and he's got chains on him. And we, I, we walk in, I'm like, oh my God. You know my dad talks to everybody. I'm like, please, don't talk to him. Let's just see if we can make it to the fourth floor without getting like, the daylight kicked out of us. And, Sure enough, we're at like floor one, uh, uh, and we're okay for like a half a floor, and then my dad says to the guy, he says, you know, I see you got a lot of tattoos. Um, do you ever regret having gotten them? And I thought, okay, it, it's over, you know? So, and, and, and he looked back at my dad and he said, he paused for a second, he said, yeah, sometimes I do, because I've got a daughter now, and she asked me, can she get them, and so on. And I, I kind of regret that I got at least this one and that one. And, you know. and, so, and so my dad says to him, I think they, they look really great on <laughs> and, then, and then the door opens and he gets out. And, you know, only Marcus Raskin, right? I mean, I thought he were dead. Um, but, but, you know, my growing up was like that, because um, I... You know, I'm not interested in a progressive club as much as I love IPS. I'm interested in a progressive world, and that means everybody. And uh, so, I just, I just, well, one more thing, just in response to, uh, to Bob, and I, there's one thing he said I really agree with and one I disagree with, and the thing I agree with is about the congressional districts. The reason we're in the fix we're in politically at the national level is um, because the Democrats got 1.4 million votes more than the Republicans did in congressional elections nationwide, and yet they ended up with more than 30 House seats more because of the single member district mode of redistricting that we've got and the gerrymandering that took place in the 2010 election. And if you want to get serious about political change, check out my friend's fair vote in the heart of District 20 who are trying to move to proportional representation methods of getting people elected to office. Okay? That's number one, and I totally agree with that. But number two is the point about constitutional politics. Um, it's true we've got to defeat the balanced budget amendment and the flag desecration amendment and all of the other junk that the right comes out with, but there's a reason they do it, which is constitutional politics is principled politics. It's where you plant a flag and you say, this is something that we believe is enduring and should be part of the country. And we should never, as progressives, run away from constitutional politics. If you read the Constitution, the, that Constitution is a record of progressive struggle and progressive victory. And I'm talking not just about the Reconstruction era with the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery and the 14th Amendment equal protection and the 15th Amendment saying no discrimination on the basis of uh, race in voting, but the 17th Amendment direct election of U.S. Senators taking, uh, taking away from the state legislatures which were soaked in bribes and the 19th Amendment giving women the right to vote, and the 23rd Amendment giving D.C. the right to participate in presidential elections, and the 24th Amendment abolishing poll taxes, the 26th Amendment lowering uh, the voting age to 18, but we still don't have a universal affirmative right to vote in America for everybody, which is why people in D.C. aren't represented in Congress, which is why we've got millions of ex-felons who still can't vote, which is why we've got millions of people in Puerto Rico, in American Samoa, in Guam, and the Virgin Islands who are disenfranchised, and 
It's why the Supreme Court can make up completely fictional reactionary doctrine like in the Citizens United case, essentially saying that corporations have political rights that people don't have. So if we want to get serious about it, then we need to amend the Constitution with a democracy amendment giving everybody the right to vote and denying corporations the right to have the political rights to vote. And I just, I want to say, these are five of the people I would call if I needed anything. I'm just reminded, looking at Medea over here, of the night that Cindy Sheehan was arrested for wearing a t-shirt in the U.S. Congress that pointed out how many people have been killed in the war. And Jody Evans, uh, who co-founded Code Pink with, with Medea, who will be here tomorrow, called me and said, what do we do? Who do we call? <laughs> I said, Jamie Rask, call Jamie Rask. Because he always answers his phone at 10, 10 p.m. at night. And Jamie answered his phone, and Jamie went down and helped get to the other jail. I mean, I feel that way about each of these people, and, and about an awful lot of you. So I, I thank you for coming to this kickoff. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, join us again for three different sessions. And as you walk out, if you didn't take one of those booklets that has the um, program in it, grab one. But let's end just with a big, uh, round of applause for the rest of the family.